What happened to Tunisia? Welcome to Connections, the Arab Studies Institute interview program. I'm Wayne Rabbani, and for this episode, we're delighted to be speaking with Huda Mziudet. Huda Mziudet is a researcher and journalist with a focus on Tunisia and Libya. She's a co-founder of ADAM, the first Black Tunisian Association, and of the Voice of Tunisian Black Women Collective. Hudem Zyudit, it's a real pleasure to welcome you to Connections, or I should say to welcome you back to Connections. Thank you for the invitation, Maureen. Um, last year, Tunisia's president, uh, Qais Sayed, completed his 2021 auto coup by designing a new constitution and a new parliament, both essentially crafted in his own image. Only 30% of voters participated in the constitutional referendum, and less than nine, yes, 9% participated in the elections for a new parliament. Mm -hmm. It seems that Sayed has eliminated all political, bureaucratic, and judicial obstacles to his rule, and today exercises absolute authority. With Tunisia having essentially entered an era of l'état c'est moi, what are the main features of his regime? I mean, uh, Saeed's regime is very similar to what any other autocratic leader ha who has um, under, um, uh, undertaken um, a coup or autogolpe, as you say in political science, um, whether it happens in, in Egypt with Sisi in 2013 in particular, that's the, probably the most uh, prominent example of that. So uh, he's, uh, he's, he's more of a populist leader. So his, um, um, his, uh, his, poli his politics is, uh, circles around, you know, the fact of conspiracy theory about, you know, uh, uh, enemies of Tunisia wanting to destroy uh, Tunisia, but also about this, this hyper-nationalism that is uh, 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 covered with uh, uh, in this mantra of, um, of, sovereign, of sovereignty being uh, something sacred to Tunisian uh, existence. Um, uh, so he's more of a you know, his regime is very similar to Bolsonaro of, of, of uh, former president of, of uh, Brazil or uh, Orban of uh, Viktor Orban of, of Hungary, of uh, using conspiracy theory to be able to, uh, to stay in power and uh, um, galvanize um, large crowds of Tunisians, you know, under uh, uh, you uh, um, um, with, uh, with 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 this uh, with this with this rhetoric about uh, the threat to Tunisian sovereignty from uh, from the enemies within. But also from outside, um, uh, his regime has unfortunately uh, descended into uh, a more fascistic tendency, especially uh, after in February 2023, with his racist speech against um, uh, Sub-Saharan African migrants, you know, accusing them of being yes. behind. And, 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 and that that we'll get to in a minute. But some of these other leaders you're mentioning, um, they have, for better or worse. Um, uh, more or less defined political programs. Aside from demagoguery, is there any meat on Sayed's bones? Mm -hmm. um, I mean, yes, it's, it's true that Sayed, you know, is, is unique that he's not someone who's got any any uh, any political party. He's someone who's out of the system. Uh, he's uh, anti, more or less anti-system, or someone who's who's. Uh, Who's, who's, who doesn't ascribe to the uh, traditional populist leader. Um, uh, I mean, he, yeah, he's, he's more like a Donald Trump in some ways because uh, someone who's out of you know, the system. But what makes sides you know, uh, different from, 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 for example, Bolsonaro or, 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 or uh, Trump is that he is a constitutional uh, law professor. So, I mean, former constitutional law professor, but he's a retired one. So his, 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 um, his use of um, uh, the, the constitution, uh, 2014 constitution to, uh, uh, to reverse the democratic, you know, transition in Tunisia through his autogolpe in July, 2021, through the use of uh, article 80 that he, um, mm -hmm. To justify well, the suspension why of parliament and, exactly. and dismissal of the government. Exactly. So, so that makes him different from other autocrats, you know, and that uh, was actually a shock for a lot of Tunisians, but also outside of observers that someone who is supposed to be uh, an intellectual um, turning into an autocrat, and that's uh, which is, and, and he's different, for example, from uh, let's say Ben Ali, you know, who was not, who was who was from the security uh, apparatus, whereas Qais Said is not, and so that. 
makes him such a unique character in the uh, political character uh, sometimes. Uh, and sometimes it's very hard to just to, to try and, you know, uh, pigeonhole him because he's, uh, he's got some Gaddafiist, you know, style sometimes, you know, um, or been like Erdogan when it comes, you know, to the the the, the, the way he deals with the uh, with the immigration crisis right now with the EU. So he's he's a, he's a kind of Frankenstein of 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 of, 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 um, of a politician in some ways, uh, and and he represents, you know, in some ways what. Uh, you know, outside observers would call the Tunisian exceptionalism. So he's an exceptional autocrat leader in that, in that respect. And one thing um, that he's been very busy with is a whole series of arrests, which have targeted not only um, prominent political leaders and opposition uh, leaders, such as uh, Rashid Ghanoushi of the Islamist Nahda party, but also um, uh, people from the business community, um, others who haven't necessarily um, been critical of the government or of him personally. Can you give us a sense of, of the um, arrest campaign and also what he has termed the anti-corruption campaign in Tunisia? Um, unfortunately, this arrest campaign has come as a lot of, as a surprise for a lot of Tunisians, but also outside observers with that, um, that uh, people who, politicians who, uh, um, including a businessman, and also three male politician uh, who have been uh, arrested and imprisoned, you know, without trial so far. Um, it, 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 it's, it's part of the string of um, a campaign of fear uh, regarding anyone who dares uh, question or even uh, hold public rallies, you know, um, uh, to, uh, against his, his, uh, his regime so far. Uh, I mean, most of the of the of those uh, all of those you know detainees and they are something in like over thirty uh, they either from the former Nahda uh, party or even from Nida Tunis and some of them from other secular um, parties including for example uh, politician Chaim Turki and some I mean uh, they all have something in common. Um, including one female politician Shayma Isa she is the first political prisoner in uh, modern Tunisian history. Uh, and so they have all something in common that all of them, they have been vocal uh, opponents to a side school. And some of the most ridiculous, you know, uh, accusations against them is uh, that some of them, they had had, let's say, coffee, you know, with uh, another political opponent, you know, to a side. Um, and they just would, were discussing, you know, uh, ways of restoring democracy to Tunisia. So that was considered, of course, for Said as a conspiracy. Uh, to, to to overthrow his uh, his regime and uh, and the threat to Tunisian um, uh, Tunisian sovereignty. So uh, some of them, of course, the, the other accusations included um, the fact that they had meetings with them with uh, with some um, Western diplomats, including the American uh, American diplomats. Uh, then the irony uh, is that you know American diplomats were totally whitewashed, whereas you know the Tunisian uh, uh, I mean. Uh, the Tunisian po uh, political opponents were, were 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 kept in jail. So there's uh, there's unfortunately this uh, very. Um, Sorry, you mean you mean that the um, uh, Americans have essentially given a certificate of approval to? Um, I mean, they were the whitewashed leadership. by the regime, but you know, they that yes, if you met with uh, with them, that doesn't mean that you you were conspiring against Tunisian state. But mm -hmm. the Tunisian opponent, I mean, the Tunisian. Uh, prisoners, you know, are the ones. I mean, the Tunisian opponents uh, to the side, you know, uh, are culprits. So it, it, this is telling of um, the, you know, the ludicrousness and uh, the um, the sense of uh, uh, arbitrariness that uh, the side regime in, in, in detaining anyone uh, who ever dares, you know, uh, question his uh, his legitimacy and his uh, and and uh, and his regime, and at the same time, you know, to so more fear. Uh, um, in, among Tunisians, uh, be it, you know, lawyers or judges or political opponents, including Tunisian citizens, you know, who could, who, who would sometimes find themselves, you know, uh, being arrested by police for simply, you know, posting uh, a critical uh, post on Facebook. So um, it's, uh, it's like back to square one when it happened, 1987, when Ben Ali, you know, uh, had his coup and, uh, and there was the string of arrests, you know, that started with the Islamists and then it had being generalized to the whole. Um, so it's a consolidation of power, essentially. And I, well, absolutely. I mean, it has been, yeah, this is, I mean, what I am I'm quoting, I like to, like to quote in an Adil Hori from uh, Arab Room Forum Initiative about uh, authoritarian restoration. Uh, yeah, that is, you know, that the Arab Spring has 
uh, is dead, where it was born in Tunisia, and then uh, it's, uh, it's another climate of fear, you know, uh, and, um, and paranoia that is uh, gripping, you know, not only his regime, but also uh, Tunisians, Tunisian general speaking right now in Tunisia, you know, people are whispering when, whenever they are in public space, especially cafes, something that we haven't had, you know, since, for, since you know, 2011, when we felt that for, for the first time, with people, they had this, uh, this ability to speak out openly mm -hmm. without fear of arrest. So it's, it's again back to 1990s Tunisia of, you know, this very mm -hmm. climate of fear and suspicion. And other. in addition to these arbitrary arrests, there have also, I believe, there have been travel bans, house arrests, um, referrals mm -hmm. to the courts yeah. and so on. Yeah, well, the travel bans, you know, had affected in 2021, mostly lawyers, um, um, but then other judges that ju there were 57 judges that have been banned and they had, uh, they have been, um, uh, they had been, uh, they had their, their, their immunity lifted. Um, this is the last battle, I think, so far that the judges have. These been were 57 judges who were forcibly retired. Exactly. They were forced to retire. But you know that the battle is not over because they are so far they're the only ones who are um, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, who are not given up on on the battle against, you know, the um, independence of the judiciary, um, because unfortunately we see that the Tunisian trade unions use it they has already almost given up on 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 trying to uh, reverse, you know, this uh, this uh, democratic backsliding. But again, you know, it is not some. <laughs> It has, has shown in, other, in the past, even during under the, 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 is the main um, Tunisian labor union, which the has labor union played a key labor. role in the transition process, such as exactly. it existed. Yeah, absolutely. And the one that you know has, uh, well, I mean, uh, was was a recipient of the Nobel Peace Prize in uh, yes. 2015 for its you know role in uh, in uh, in a version actually at the times you know uh, um, an Egypt, an Egypt style coup in 20, 2013. So so the irony here right now is with the with the trade unions is that um, uh, this time you know they were unable you know to to get you know uh, Saeed to come to um, to some kind of compromise or also to dialogue you know with different political opponents because Saeed doesn't listen at all. I mean his is is this is why he's an atypical figure political figure where uh, for him uh, uh, the, the, the mere idea of, uh, of negotiating with, um, with the political opponents is, amounts to some sort of you know, conspiracy against you know, the state, but you know, that, that, that there is no way that he will, um, will speak to, though, to anyone who would dare uh, um, question his legitimacy, especially uh, call even, I mean, uh, use the C, the C word, you know, the coup, you know, uh, as a way um, to delegitimize his authority. So, um, um, yeah. A leader who's persuaded only by the sound of his own voice. Um, well, absolutely, yeah. Absolutely. I'd now like to turn to um, the issue of xenophobia, which you um, referred to previously. Uh, this February, as, a, as the campaign of arbitrary arrests ordered by Syed was reaching a crescendo, he gave a speech to his National Security Council in which he accused unnamed forces of seeking to transform Tunisia's demography by replacing Tunisians with sub-Saharan Africans, and then concluded with a demand that the security forces intervene to put a stop to this uh, conspiracy. His xenophobic demagoguery, as you know, unleashed a wave of racist attacks against African migrants, many of whom had been living and working in Tunisia for many years, as well as against Black Tunisians. Um, how did this campaign affect African migrants and Black Tunisians? Well, unfortunately, I have to say it was a uh, it was very uh, traumatic experience, but also it was very very scary episode in Tunisian history, uh, modern history at least. You know, when uh, we saw some Black witch hunt, you know, uh, of 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 um, of uh, people, some vigilante groups, you know, going trying and hunting Black people, including you know some Black Tunisians who who found themselves, you know, in the crossfire of this uh, witch hunt. So um, would it be fair to say that Black Tunisians were not in any way exempt from this um, they were, crisis they were campaign? Not. They were not. Even if, unfortunately, a lot of them, they would take it, you know, with, uh, you know, lightly because of the way that, you know, the security forces in Tunisia, when they arrest, you know, anyone or that the, the violence has been normalized, you know, is, 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 is usually... Uh, seen as the new norm, and that's kind of uh, th that's something that you know that represents you know, uh, and that's that's that that, that describes you now how the regime of Saeed after twenty twenty one coup that uh, 
uh, that the security forces they 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 felt emboldened by that you know that uh, uh, that um, physical integrity would no longer matter for anyone could be you know uh, would be a fair game for for, for their violence uh, but this time when it came what it was it was something that was very systematic targeting any sub-Saharan African migrants, including, you know, the student population. Um, it is to be noted that Tunisia has got a, um, has got a, a strong, you know, uh, sub-Saharan African, especially West African, but also from West Francophone Africa, including from the Comoros Islands and and, um, and other and other Francophone. So just Africa. to be clear, this, this was not a campaign that was directed against, for example, undocumented migrants who were um, not who only were targeted that's on the basis of their status this was a campaign that took skin color as its um, mm -hmm. operational uh, let's say uh, prim primary operational principle sadly it it, it 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 simply went into very into this blind uh, operation campaign of uh, you know targeting anyone who looked you know black african you know quote unquote and and in some ways, it uh, it was a shock uh, for a lot of Tunisians, you know, to see that uh, the, the the rhetoric about the great replacement that is being espoused, you know, uh, in 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 in, uh, in by the far right in in Europe, in particular, for people like you know, for example, Orban of Hungary, uh, but also Eric Zemmour uh, of France. Eric Zemmour himself is congratulated by side for for being, you know, uh, for uh, for speaking out loud, you know, about you know the the evil design of these sub-Saharan African migrants who want to change the demographics of, uh, of North Africa. So, uh, so the, 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 there were also, I mean, of course, there was spor sporadic violence. Not, I wouldn't say it was nationwide, but it, you know, it targeted, you know, sub-Saharan African migrants living in Tunisia's largest city in the capital Tunis, but in particular in Sfax, you know, which has a large, you know, sub-Saharan African population there, some of them, most of them living on the periphery of the city. And a lot of them, they are not in Tunisia because they want to stay there forever, but because most of them, they want to reach out to Europe. So Tunisia was a transit point. And, um, and so this, this, this whole, uh, this whole uh, campaign against, you know, targeting black Africans, but anyone who happens to, uh, to have uh, black skin was also fueled by some t Tunisian media because they played a, a, a very, very negative role in, in to fueling, you know, the anti-black, um, and anti-black migrant feelings uh, among Tunisians, and uh, and the, this kind of paranoia has gripped, you know, most uh, most Tunisians about, you know, the presence of hordes of Africans, you know, and the inflation of the number of of, of of those black African migrants, you know, amounted to one million, you know, trying to invade Tunisia when statistics, you know, from the Tunisian Institute of National Statistics would would put their number to no, I mean, I mean, no more than 21,000, you know, so, so, uh, so conspiracy theory played a huge role in that. And, unfortunately, because when you have, when you have an opaque, you know, um, uh, media uh, landscape that, um, that, 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 that is being also uh, under control of, 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 um, of, of, of the of leadership. The of the leadership exactly that makes it very hard for i mean that 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 opens the door for 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 anyone you know to to to, to attack anyone who happens to be black and and it and, and it and it affected you know the student population which uh, which uh, i mean which represents you know um an economic you know opportunity mm -hmm. for, for tunisia because most of them they they come from uh, from well-off families when from west african countries like Cote d'Ivoire but also countries like um, uh, Senegal, Mali, Guinea, etc., and and they they all of a sudden they found themselves you know they have been they had to be airlifted to their countries and I have seen images of unfortunately of uh, of uh, of nationals from from Burkina Faso from from Guinea you know having uh, from of Cote d'Ivoire having had you know been uh, airlifted from to, to that country. Well, that, that was going to be my next question: Is what mm -hmm. happened to these people? Were they beaten up in the streets? Were they imprisoned? Were they deported? Were they rescued mm -hmm. by their home governments? Was mm -hmm. it a combination of the above? Yeah, I mean, it's a combination of all of these things. Many of them were beaten. Some of them, they had their face slashed, you know. But the, the worst, you know, the, the most vulnerable ones were women, you know, such an African migrant women's thing, because not only they were before actually the campaign, they were victims of human trafficking, uh, but also uh, uh, but also um, sexual violence, you know, because of not only because of the skin color, but because also of the misogyny uh, regarding the, sexu the sexuality of, of, of black African women in Tunisian imagination. So, uh, so uh, yeah, there were some, many of them that were beaten, some uh, others, you know, they had, they had their houses, you know, been raided, some, they had their houses even, you know, been burned and their property been burned as well. And so, when 
you say <laughs> houses raided, are you talking about women who were um, residents of Tunisia or were there? Well, a mix of residents, but also you know, some, you know, uh, some uh, regular, uh, regular migrants. But, you know, but the situation in Tunisia with the Sub-Saharan African migrants is, uh, is very complex because a lot of them, they come to Tunisia, you know, uh, as regular migrants, especially from Cote d'Ivoire, because Tunisia, Cote d'Ivoire, Ivorian, uh, nationals do not need visa to Tunisia, and so when they stay in Tunisia, they will they would undertake you know the very perilous you know and exhausting you no know, um, uh, process of trying to regularize themselves. But you know because of the Tunisian Minister of Interior is the one that regularizes you know uh, migrants. You know they end up you know becoming irregular migrants because of the 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 bureaucracy, the heavy bureaucracy, and the, uh, the, the, the how hard it is for them to get you know uh, legal the, status, exact permanent residence. So they end up being, becoming irregular, and then in the eyes of the authorities, they are uh, they are um, they have overstayed you know their their stay in Tunisia, and so they are um, uh, they are. Almost, like criminals, and so uh, they had to pay, you know, fines and all that. So the, the, the uh, going through this bureaucratic nightmare is is what made you know things even worse for those uh, regular uh, black, black African migrants because that's not the case, for example, for let's say what Western European you know migrants. A lot of them, you know, they live in Tunisia. Uh, for and they have overstayed their their stay the three months stay in Tunisia because they do, they only need you know an ID card to come to Tunisia for example French nationals they only need an ID card to come to Tunisia but they will never get you know the same terrible treatment because of by virtue of the, the skin color so there is this unfortunately you know um, the anti black you know um, uh, feeling you know a racist among, double standard absolutely absolutely yeah. yeah. And, and were these attacks primarily conducted by the security forces or was there also significant popular participation by ordinary Tunisians? Yeah, it's both. I mean, the security forces, they had to done their job, basically, you know, of, of, of cracking down on those irregular migrants who have been accused, you know, of, of uh, committing crimes, you know, against Tunisians, especially in the city of Sfax, you know, they have been, you know, accused of all types of, you know, conspiracy theories about them, them, you know, trying to, you know, having, you know, um, you know, wanting to take over, you know, some police stations or having their own, you know, um, uh, parallel, you know, um, you know, um, uh, societies or some kind of um, uh, uh, communities or uh, or group or, I mean or um, or um, 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 associations so uh, in order to destabilize the country um, so security forces was 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 uh, going on uh, after, after after you know you know some what they would suspect as uh, as um, as uh, traffickers you know uh, and of course they were targeting you know uh, you know, uh, regular African migrants, uh, but also some Tunisian, you know, ordinary Tunisians who would live, for example, in in uh, in, in vigilantes. In yeah, vigilantes live in, in in neighborhoods of uh, that have you know high concentration of Sub-Saharan African migrants, especially in Tunis, but also in parts of Sfax as well, because that that wasn't the case, for example, in other uh, let's say southern Tunisian cities, you know, whether in in Medin or Gabs or Zarzis, especially Zarzis in particular, which has a, a, a you know a strong a sub saharan African migrants, but you know a lot of them they they live um, in uh, some like a you know a, a host um, center that uh, that was set up by the Tunisian Red Crescent, and there were no uh, incidents of attacks on them. So mm -hmm. it, it was. It was, so it was a mixed uh, picture depending on the geography. Exactly. The absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And, and was Syed resorting to this type of xenophobia primarily to deflect attention from his political and economic failures, or did this campaign represent a broader agenda on his part? Also, it's very mixed because you have, uh, uh, you have Syed, uh, someone who is a populist and who who believes in uh, the people's, um, his, his own image of what the people want, you know, he is the embodiment of, of exactly, the people, their of, aspirations. Of, of, exactly, of their aspiration, but also of, of their will. And so because there was a campaign that has been started since 2018 by um, an obscure Tunisian uh, uh, national party called the Tunisian Nationalist Party, uh, who's, um, who's, uh, who's, who's most, whose rhetoric is mostly, you know, similar to the Tea Party, for example, in the US, or even some, you know, or the the most part, you know, La Conquête, very, very xenophobic, very racist and anti-Black African, uh, and which used actually um, um, 
uh, the, 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 uh, which, which, whose, whose message was also to counter Afrocentrism. So uh, uh, it's funny because they were uh, trying to use, you know, to, to, to personify Tunisia as the new Palestine, uh, where, which is a victim of these new invaders who want to turn Tunisia into a uh, new Palestine through uh, with the design of Europeans as they have done in 1948 by populating, you know, Tunisia with these new, new invaders and by trying to find, you know, links between Afrocentrism and Zionism. So um, having this conspiracy theory, which is which, which was thriving in Tunisia. Yeah, that seemed a bit of a stretch. Oh, absolutely. It was, yeah, it was, it was probably the best stretch that, you know, I side, you know, could ever find, you know, uh, as a way, you know, to deflect attention from the, 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 uh, the, the acute economic crisis that was, uh, that, uh, that the country has, has, has witnessed, not only since you know the coup, but also with the with the with the Ukraine war and uh, and um, and the economic crisis that you know that has uh, sw yeah. over swept over the, the the continent. So uh, so yeah, the, the, it was a, it's a mix of uh, all of these things. And, and I don't think I personally don't think that high side you know is uh, I mean has uh, has got this you know strong ideology you know uh, like you know Eric Zemmour that you know um, yeah. of 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 uh, of uh, thinking, you know, uh, being convinced about that because, you know. So, so, so the main impetus was opportunism is what you're saying. Absolutely, absolutely. Because, you know, we have seen that after his speech, you know, there was a strong condemnation from the African Union, from yeah. the Francophonie. Francophonie, you know, had, she was very uh, disappointed by his, uh, by his speech because, you know, uh, a few months earlier, he, uh, Tunisia hosted the Francophonie summit and um, he was trying to deflect, you know, uh, uh, deflect, uh, uh, from, I mean, the, um, uh, you know, and to, to backtrack from his from his from his from uh, from his statements but i know. think he also managed to insult some of the uh, african heads of state who made representations to him sorry can i say that again um, i think he also managed to insult some of the african heads of state who were making representations to him about this issue yes i mean i i remember that he uh when he met with uh with the ECOWAS head he was um it was trying to use, you know, the same racist tropes, you know, that usually sometimes I would say probably to say it's, it's a mix of naivete on his side, but also opportunism of that he has black friends that he cannot he cannot be racist, you know, uh, and uh, and it shows, you know, um, uh, this ambiguity in his personality that this is someone who uh, who who only used, you know. Uh, the, the 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 African migrants, you know, crisis as a way, you know, to 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 drive away, you know, accusations um, of, of, of against to deflect him. Deflect from his failures in office, essentially. Uh, not only in, about in, in, um, uh, in politically, but also in the economy, but also right. uh, finding a way to uh, to 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 um, um, to rally people to, behind him. Rally people behind him, but um, make a new enemy, like you know, produce a new enemy yes. that within. And this is something that you know, you know, uh, in the past, you know, uh, populist leaders you know have used. You know, uh, if we can go back to Hitler himself, you know, at the time, you know, unfortunately using you know the the, the Jewish peril. Now it's the black peril in, uh, with my mm -hmm. side. Even though I have to say, in the last few few weeks, you know, uh, his visit to Sfax, you know, trying and holding, you know, uh, uh, West African baby, you know, trying to, you know, this. Again, this is opportunism on his side, but it shows, you know, that his nationalism is, is not as thick as we would think, for example, because Tunisian nationalism is not something that we can compare, for example, to Turkish nationalism or other nationalism in the area. So uh, it's it's mostly opportunism on his side, uh, playing that, you know, conspiracy theory game, which is very easy, you know, for people in Tunisia right now, you know, to, to espouse because of uh, how, how desperate they are, because of the yeah. political fatigue, you know, people are no longer, you know, they have this, um, this uh this breath you know the 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 force you know to to go on and just uh uh protest against his his, his authority because you know it can't be worse than that so it's, this, yeah. it's like you know they find themselves like in a dead end right now and and as far as the um tunisian opposition is concerned um uh did it actively defend those targeted by this racist campaign and work to bring it to an end or did they take a more passive attitude towards these events? Well, most of them, they took a passive attitude because, you know, I have to say that um, a lot of them, they they had, you know, some of the leaders they imprisoned. Of course, there were one or two voices, you know, who 
definitely, you know, uh, uh, condemn the Qaisai's, you know, rhetoric, you know, including from Tayyar, you know, who, um, and even not some, some another uh, uh, political, um, political uh, leaders, you know, um, um, condemning those, uh, the, the, that rhetoric as not only being racist and fascist, but also as, uh, as, as, uh, as a failure on, on Christ's side, you know, to find, you know, uh, a good, you know, scapegoat, you know, and finding a black, uh, black Africans as a scapegoat is um, uh, actually, back, uh, you know, uh, um, backfired on him rather than, you know, helped him, you know, uh, especially in the continent, because mm -hmm. uh, for the first time, you know, Tunisia was no longer seen as a safe place for to be to be black in, in, uh, in, in, um, in Africa, you know, and the first time, you know, Tunisia, which ironically was one of the founders of the African Union, you know, with mm -hmm. Burkiba, the was, Organization uh, of African Unity. Africa, is exactly, of the yeah. African Unity, but now is, has become, you know, uh, the, the fascist country where, where Blacks, you know, are being chased, you know, in the street and, um, and where nationals of West African countries countries were warning their, um, I mean, uh, leaders of Afri West African countries were warning their, their nationals not to go to Tunisia. Because Travel advisories. Yeah. yeah, exactly. That was in, in February and March. It's now June, four months after Syed uh, unleashed this campaign of terror. Um, what's the current situation for African migrants and Black Tunisians like? Well, uh, mostly, but I mean, I, have to, I, I can speak on African migrants mostly because, you know, they're the ones who are targeted uh, targeted by that campaign a lot of them they try to you know to escape the country because you know they don't they would they didn't feel safe in the in tunisia so we have seen a surge in uh, in uh, in uh, in uh, in the number of, uh, of people uh, trying to cross the mediterranean to italy uh, and the number that uh, at one time you know um, a Tunisian Coast Guard would uh, would come up, would come with one, at least one hundred bodies of people who have drowned because they couldn't reach the Italian coast. Uh, so you, you see a direct relationship between this campaign on the one hand and mostly, yeah. increased, um, uh, let's say, attempts to cross the Mediterranean on the yeah, other. Yeah, mostly, mostly because you know these people they were left in, they 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 were living in limbo. They couldn't mm -hmm. go back. Home because some most of them they come from countries that are either in war or uh, some of them uh, their countries you know in uh, witnessing you know um, uh, you know uh, campaigns of ethnic cleansing you know for some of them they were from Sudan for example there were mm -hmm. Sudanese women you know who have been who have seen themselves you know outside in the street you know in um, uh, and and um, uh, asking um, the UNHCR and IOM you know to relocate them to third countries including whether in the US or Canada. Yeah. And and um, and be, and also it's the failure, as I have to say, of, of UNHCR and IOM for 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 leaving IOM, this. the International Organization for Migration. Exactly, and the United Nations and uh, uh, Human uh, uh, High Commissioner uh, for Refugees. Uh, yeah. Refugees. So both of them, they failed. You know, these uh, a lot of those nationals, who especially the ones who are refugees, because they these two, these also they have been. Uh, attacked as well um, because uh, a lot of them they cannot go home because uh, for, for for reasons you know uh, for, for, for political reasons and so they were asking you know uh, those organizations to to relocate them to a safer country but you know so they found themselves you know stuck in Tunisia so they tried you know to cross the into the Mediterranean you know made women babies and and some of them they made it but most it couldn't make it unfortunately and this is when. Uh, 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 Italian Prime Minister Giorgia Meloni came to, to the rescue of Kaisai. I'll, I'll get to that. Uh, I, I'd like to discuss that further with you um, later, but before doing so, um, I'd like to also briefly uh, discuss the economic situation in Tunisia. And as you know, Tunisia's economic crisis, of course, preceded Syed's uh, assumption of power, but has also worsened um, during his rule. What are the main features and consequences for ordinary Tunisians of this economic crisis? Well, the economy has been terrible, you know, since, you know, Qaisaid's, you know, coup, because, you know, uh, because he came at a very good time. I mean, this is why, why, why his coup, you know, kind of was very popular. It was when Tunisians um, were suffering under, uh, because of COVID and there were uh, the, the, the number of deaths, you know, through to COVID, you know, skyrocketed, and um, and uh, and because of that, you know, people were extremely upset with the with the with the former uh, government of uh, of um, of Mishishi, uh, who was the last uh, prime minister that, ironically, like I said, has appointed, you know, under you know, uh, in the parliament, of course, um, uh, uh, supported the by a parliamentary majority of an Nahd of the Islamists. Absolutely, yes, yeah. exactly, and so uh, so. That was COVID situation has helped, you know, uh, Kaiside school, but also the economic situation as well. And so people uh, were hoping that the economic situation would would, uh, would improve. 
it did not. Uh, and then, of course, came the, the Ukraine war and um, the fact that Tunisia imports a lot of its uh, um, grain of its grain from from Ukraine. So that 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 uh, that produced, you know, um, a huge you know shortage of um, uh, of uh, of wheat in the country and, and price uh, increases, I presume. Prices increases of absolutely uh, everywhere. Um, and for the first time, I think since maybe the 1960s, you know, we would see Tunisians you know, queuing for uh, for for bread, for yeah. rice. For coffee, something that um, that 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 was uh, that has become now the new norm, unfortunately, for Tunisians. And so, and of course, by side he went on, and instead of you know um, trying to uh, you know um, use reason, you know, uh, and uh, explain you know at least to the Tunisian population why you know the prices have gone up, he just used you know the shortest cut uh, and of, of, of blaming you know uh, outside forces, you know, and those uh, the, some you know the Monopolizers, you know, of of mm -hmm. of, uh, of hiding, you know, uh, uh, hoarding cities mm -hmm. uh, and and hoarding food, you know, uh, from Tunisians in order to, you know, um, in price order to... gouging and 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 exactly, so on. yeah. And, and Tunisia has um, been seeking a, a multi-billion dollar loan from the International Monetary Fund, the IMF, to avoid a default. Um, but these negotiations have stalled on account of conventional IMF structural adjustment demands that Tunisia eliminate many subsidies that assist the poor and that it also privatized state-owned enterprises. I don't want to discuss the details of these negotiations, but rather the way that Syed has used them to bolster his position by, um, you've repeatedly mentioned his nationalism, and he's now basically said, you know, we won't be dictated to by the IMF and so on, even though it's his government that's also conducting these negotiations. Yes, I mean, uh, this is uh, this is definitely part of his nationalistic, you know, uh, rhetoric of uh, and his sovereignty. Or his demagoguery, if you will. Exactly, yeah. yeah. Using this, uh, this, this, uh, this, uh, this rhetoric about, you know, Tunisian sovereignty that should not be, uh, uh, that is a red line when it comes, you know, to, uh, to, to, the, to the IMF, but also to the World Bank when it comes, you know, to these structural adjustments mm -hmm. that have been, it's, I mean, it's not something new because it has been going on since Ben Ali, you know, at the time and then through after the, the revolution, you know, Tunisia successive Tunisian governments you know have had this pressure from IMF for more reforms you know economic reforms uh size at this time you know has can kind of continued you know the same type of you know uh That's nothing new really the, yeah, reservation uh, to, towards exactly to, towards IMF, you know, uh, pushing for reforms because at the time it was mostly, you know, uh, the the UGT, the Tunisian trade unions, you know, who would oppose that. Mm -hmm. So there was a tug of war between the UGT and the Tunisian successful Tunisian government, you know, uh, of not, you know, succumbing to the the, the to the, the uh, international financial institutions, you know, um, dictates. Now, Saeed, you know, has has given it, you know, like you know, a, a more forceful, you know. Um, rhetoric, you know, by like not, uh, you know, succumbing to the dictates at all, because, you know, uh, what IMF wants, you know, is exactly what uh, happened. I mean, is 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 t Tunisian, you know, uh, economic, you know, uh, downfall, because, and he, he, I think a few weeks ago, he, he, um, he did mention the fact that in 1984, Tunisian bread riots, you know, were mm -hmm. actually uh, uh, due to the fact that, 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 the, that the international financial institutions, you know, wanted Tunisia to, to, you know, to, to have these reforms, which are totally unpopular because, you know, it, mm -hmm. it will, uh, it will hurt mostly, you know, the, 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 the middle poor. class, not only, yeah. you know, not only the poor, but also the middle class as well. And so his hyper-nationalistic, you know, rhetoric, you know, uh, that he used, you know, about, you know, to, to urge Tunisians to, be, to become self-reliant and um, to, 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 to show uh, you know, um, a form of self-sacrifice so, so that the, uh, the crisis is over. And his deep conviction that Tunisia is very rich to get back on it on it um, on its feet, you know, by uh, by by getting back the stolen assets, you know, that you need, that uh, the, or also to need Tunisian natural resources such as gas, oil, and salt, and and this is something that has been uh, the, this his rhetoric comes actually from the what his imagined Tunisian people who back in the night in 2017 and 16 they were um, uh, protesting in in, in in the in Tunisian in the Tunisian south uh, especially the, near the uh, oil facilities uh, near the Libyan border uh, about you know a, a supposed you know um, 
uh, oil theft from you know uh, from European and other Western uh, oil companies. And so, uh, and because Saito started his let's say his career as as a politician in the in the in the in the Tunisian hinterland, especially in the south of Tunisia, where he has become very popular because of his rhetoric about you know uh, um, 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 reclaiming Tunisian um, Tunisian oil, Tunisian gas, yes. all these this imaginary uh, uh, Tunisian assets that you know that uh, has been stolen by not only the, by Western you know, firms, but also by the former regimes. And of course, he also blames, you know, the former government so, uh, under another for having, you know, been not only corrupt, but also having um, wandered the resources exactly, of, of the country. So so that that worked very well, you know, in, 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 in the uh, with with the, with the people in the streets that, you know, Tunisia is a very rich country. It's only uh, the fact that, you know, there are people who are stealing its assets. And so uh, and all the uh, and all the, uh, you know, the the. Uh, food scarcity is definitely due to those uh, uh, to 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 those outside forces that are you know. Bent and, the, and this would fit in with his general anti-corruption uh, rhetoric. That um, absolutely, I mean, yeah, that exactly. The crisis can be explained by the corruption of others rather than the yeah, failure of yeah, government and because, uh, it, because and because. And because you know, in 2019, you know, he 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 uh, he, he, uh, he got this overwhelming, you know, a plebiscite from Tunisians about oh, by over 70 percent, you know, uh, because he's a clean professor, uh, former right. professor who 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 is so to, who represents, you know, the the antithesis of his uh, predecessor. Yeah. So he he played on that anti-corruption campaign uh, that worked very well, and I think I think still works with some Tunisians, you know, even though there is. Um, you know, uh, the, his popularity is waning well every day, especially uh, given the current crisis. Turning again to um, Tunisia's foreign relations, earlier this month, the European Union delegation consisting of European Commission President uh, Ursula von der Leyen and um, joined by the Italian and Dutch prime ministers visited Tunis, promising something along the lines of a billion euros in aid to support the Tunisian economy. Um, but the reason for their mission was not Tunisia's faltering economy or faltering uh, democratic transition, but rather reducing the number of migrants making their way to Europe uh, mm -hmm. via Tunisian shores. How would you assess the West's policy towards Tunisia, and particularly that of um, the European Union and its member states? Mm -hmm. Well, if we can, yeah, the 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 the. Uh, the the vision or uh, the, posi the position of the West is very divided between the EU on the one hand and the Americans on the other hand. I have to say that the Americans have been extremely straightforward and very firm that I sides, you know, uh, that they will not uh, uh, accept, you know, um, uh, I side school that uh, that the only way for, you know, to, you know, that conditioned, you know, the IMF deal with return to reforms and uh, and uh, democracy in Tunisia. Now the EU is different. Even the EU itself is divided between the Italians, uh, in particular, um, totally, so, you know, uh, supporting his uh, his his coup, you know, in with Meloni, especially because after her, her um, after she came to power in September 2022, as the uh, Italian prime minister. Prime Minister uh, Giorgia Meloni, and now with the French, they are uh, like something in between because they're trying not to, um, to 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 be on the same, let's say, wavelength with the, with the British and the Germans. Now with a big and and the French, of course, were famously caught with their pants down in two thousand eleven when the Tunisian yes, exactly. Uprising. So they didn't want to, to to probably repeat the same mistakes as twenty eleven. But again, uh, given how the authoritarian restoration has gripped the whole region and how you know someone like Assad has been welcomed back into the realm of the Arab leagues and Assad you know, himself, you know, welcoming that you know as as uh, uh, as as a new era in in, in the Arab world. Um, the, the the EU has has, has become uh, extremely you know um, uh, nervous about you know the the uh, the migration the, the migration crisis in particular and we've seen it with the British you know uh, having made a deal with the Rwanda of, of eradicating mm -hmm. you know uh, migrants there um, so they the, the EU in some ways they have a very myopic vision vision of Tunisia uh, that is very short sighted on uh, on on of, of not of support I mean supporting you know. Uh, the autocrat on the ground because, you know, for security reasons. Well, and, and of course, um, Western governments, particularly uh, European ones, claim that they're supporting democracy and human rights and that these are their key objectives in their 
Tunisia policy, but you're saying that's not really consistent with your research and observations. No, it's not because, you know, there's self-interest in that. Uh, I mean, even uh, after 2011, when uh, Tunisian, uh, Tunisian, uh, Tunisia, um, uh, Tunisia started- When uh, Ben Ali was overthrown. Was overthrown and the Tunisia started its, its, its path towards democratization. There were, you know, lots of financial supports from EU, in particular Germany, the British, but also uh, obviously from the, from the Americans, but that also, was uh, it didn't come you know without strength i mean uh, didn't come um, it, it came with a price you know behind and it wasn't string attached you know so it's uh it's mostly security you know uh, package that uh, tunisia would be like the buffer zone um against let's say jihadist for example you know uh, uh threats from neighboring libya in particular, but also from Algeria as well, because you know uh, the, the 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 threats still of of, of Akim, you know the um, Al Qaeda and the Maghreb and the Sahel. And would it so, be uh, fair to say that they now see Tunisia primarily as a border patrolman, um, keeping migrants out of Europe? Yes, absolutely. I mean, it has it has always it has always been the case. I have to say since Ben Ali, but now it has become even more because of the of of how Tunisia has become. Uh, Today, uh, at least you know, in the, in the, since, I mean, since early this year, uh, um, uh, a transit point for a lot of sub-Saharan African migrants. Uh, in the past, it used to be Libya, uh, mm. but because of the 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 the, the whole uh, scandal about you know uh, the uh, the militias you know uh, holding you know uh, slave auctions in Libya and the human trafficking and slavery you know um, accusations of Libyan militias, uh, Algeria is doing also the job of you know stemming the migrants you know back into the Sahara. With, with the desert near Niger. Uh, there were accusations, of course, of the Algerian regime of pushing all uh, a lot of the Sub-Saharan African migrants into Tunisia mm -hmm. through the borders with Tunisia, because Tunisia has got the longest border with Algeria. And so um, all of a sudden, Tunisia found itself with with all uh, with with thousands of 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 of, of, uh, of Sub-Saharan African migrants and trying to cross into 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 the Mediterranean into Europe. And Tunisia found itself, you know, again being the 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 the, the the coast guard for for Europe because Europe has always used Tunisia as its back garden so it was not new the only thing was is, is that you have the Italian fascist government of Meloni right now you know uh, asking explicitly Tunisia you know to play that role Said of course you know has said no and so he reminds me a little bit uh, of Gaddafi back in 2010 when he was manipulating the EU about you know uh, not you know uh, not not um, either. Uh, um, you using the migrant file for leverage. Um, yeah, for leverage. In his own negotiations. Keeping with, them, you know, even yeah. Erdogan has been doing the same thing. Yeah. Now with his yeah. You know, uh, and and what about the role of uh, regional governments? You mentioned Algeria. Well, Algeria has also has been playing a dubious role, which is not very uh, different from the Italians. I mean, unfortunately, not to say Tunisia and I mean Ita Italy and Italian, the Italian and the Algerian regimes, you know, have been uh, manipulating the Tun Tunisian president right now um, uh, into the Algerian regime in 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 in, um, in uh, playing a dubious role in uh, in uh, um, making. Uh, Tunisia look like it is ungovernable. So um, uh, President Taboon, you know, uh, is uh, in some ways uh, uh, always tr trying, you know, to to play the big brother, you know, uh, uh, image of, of of someone who who wants to protect Tunisian interests against, you know, Western you know, intervention. But at the same time, seeing that, you know, uh, sides, you know, as 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 a, as a populist who's unable, you know, to to control not only the, the the migrant crisis but also the economic uh, the economic situation in the country. So in some ways, um, Algeria is complicit in in the in the in the migrant crisis by uh, leaving you know um, uh, the borders open for for many migrants. You know, uh, especially the ones who have who who, who are unable you know, to reach Europe through Algeria into Tunisia. And this complicity, unfortunately, is uh, is telling about you know how weak the the the, the Right. The, the side regime in 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 in, in tackling this crisis. Reason enough why you know the Italians they came to the rescue, but it also shows you know that he has got some liberal side in that you know by by flatly saying that Tunisia will not the coast guard for 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 yeah. for, uh, for Europeans, and that actually gives him like you know a, a, a bonus you know for the Tunisian population, including among people who uh, who have been vocal critics, because for most Tunisians you know there's no way that 
that uh, that uh, that uh, Tunisia will become a resettlement, you know, um, place, you know, for for uh, some yeah. Afghan workers. There needs to be another solution out of that. And and also on, on the subject of of uh, regional governments, you earlier mentioned Syed and Egypt Sisi in the same breath, and. Um, uh, Egypt and the UAE are said to have also been main instigators or at least supporters of Syed's auto coup. Are they still playing a significant role in Tunisia? Um, probably in in the first, you know, uh, first, you know, uh, first days or months of, of the coup, mm -hmm. for sure, because, uh, uh, I mean, the, the Egyptians, you know, has welcomed, you know, Saeed, you know, quite the time. Uh, and Saeed has always, you know, been very fascinated by by the Sisi regime, you know, uh, the success. Um, and even when his min prime minister, uh, Najla Boudin, has visited Egypt and uh, as a way you know, to to copy the Egyptian experience, you know, and its success there. Uh, now with the uh, with with uh, with how, you know, with the, the whole, poly you know, um, uh, with how um, uh, um, ge geopolitics in in in, uh, in the region has changed, you know, we have seen you know uh, throwing of the relations between uh, UAE and uh, Turkey, uh, UAE and uh, Qatar, but also with the Saudis and the Iranians today. So um, there, there it, 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 there is a, a, some kind of retirement from these regimes from openly supporting Saeed. I mean, except the only the only regime with, that would definitely support Saeed is, is the Syrian regime. And 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 it's still, you know, Tunisia is not uh, uh, doesn't play a big role in, in, in the geopolitics of big mm -hmm. big regional powers and their uh, proxies, for example, the Russians. So um, so the support is not as strong as it looks like. Uh, it's only probably most some Right now, it's mostly the Italians because uh, mm -hmm. Tunisia. These are Tunisians' neighbors, and they, these are the who are mostly affected by the uh, uh, by the I crisis. Imagine. This is why you know Meloni has 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 come to Tunisia twice in in less than a week, and then we have the the, the uh, two days ago we had the the French um, Minister of Interior and the German Minister of Interior coming with a whole package of. Um, of money, you know, uh, financial aid for Tunisia again to stem in, uh, stem uh, uh, stem um, uh, right. the, the crisis in Tunisia. So, so yeah, it's, the geopolitics is mostly affecting the Tunisia's neighbors rather than uh, others in the in the, mid, in, the, in the Middle East. And and finally, um, what is your prognosis for Tunisia in the coming months? Well, I, uh, admittedly, this, speculative question, but um, oh my, to... uh, the, I, oh my gosh! I mean, because given how unpredictable my size is, you know, uh, very much like Gaddafi used to be like, um, I think it's gonna be uh, it's gonna be very tough for him, you know, to uh, for, for for the regime, you know, to uh, to deal with this with this migrant crisis. It's not gonna it's not gonna be over, you know, anytime soon, unfortunately. So, so we will see more demagoguery then. Yeah, I mean the, the usual the business as usual for for him, but that's not it's not really the case, you know, for him doubling down on that. It's mostly on the fact that he will he will be firm when it comes, you know, to to, to becoming the EU's, you know, Coast Guard. Uh, that's something that will probably give him more legitimacy among a lot of Tunisians. But the economic crisis will 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 subside, unfortunately. So um, and um, uh, I can't say if. Uh, if his regime will survive in the next uh, few months, uh, probably not in 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 the next few years, because you know there there will be a fatigue in the population, especially if if none of the of the promises that he made about anti-corruption uh, are being fulfilled. I wouldn't be surprised that there will be another uprising. So it would uh, collapse under the weight of its own failures, essentially. It will, it will, but not in not in the in the short term. Uh, probably in the in the in the longer term. But that also needs, uh, you know, uh, in the diffusion theory, I think it needs more, you know, uh, uh, you know, more uh, another uh, presence elsewhere. But I don't see that coming. But you know, everything is possible because you know, in two thousand and ten, no one, you know, has predicted that you know someone who brought himself, you know, would be behind, you know, the the collapse of, of regimes in the in the area. So um, I will wait and see you know, how how things you know, will, will evolve in the next few years. And we'll certainly keep an eye on it. And in the meantime, Hudam Zudet, uh, thank you so much for bringing your expertise and insights to connections. It's been a fascinating conversation. Thank you, Moeen, for this invitation.